Welcome to the Moto Curious. We're here to increase access and inclusion in motorsports, especially motorcycling, one question and answer at a time. I'm your host, Sarah Lobkovich. I'm a highly trained, still slow motorcyclist, but the rider I am today is not the rider I'll always be, right, Coach Nick? And I co-own C-Dub Moto Racing, currently campaigning in the Stock 1000 class in Moto America. My husband, Chris, crew chiefs the team and operates Counterweight Motorsport, a Pacific Northwest race shop focused on excellence and innovation. We build fast bikes for serious riders. We also focus on developing hardworking talent who may not otherwise have access to the national paddock in our sport. Drop me your questions at sarah at cwmoto.com. That's S-A-R-A at cwmoto.com. And we're at cdub underscore moto everywhere on social and at the Moto Curious on Instagram. If you're hearing my voice, you belong here. And I'm excited to have you as part of our community of motorcycle curious people. So let's get this episode started. Hi, friends. This is kind of a weird day to sit down and try and record a podcast. It is Sunday, (laughs) July 31st, and I am oddly home. Uh, It's a race weekend out at Brainerd, but the track day org that I work with booked me like a year in advance before the Moto America schedule came out for an event this weekend. So Chris is at Brainerd supporting some other teams this weekend. Our rider, Sean Thomas, is still out injured, and we're taking a little bit of a mid-season hiatus to regroup and hopefully finish the Moto America Stock 1000 season strong at the end of the season. More on that in a future podcast episode. So I am home right now, and I spent this morning watching the races on television from my sofa for the first time since we joined the series in Atlanta in 2021. So it was pretty weird, I have to admit, pretty surreal to watch from home today. But I appreciated getting to see that perspective. When we're with the series, we see certain things from Hot Pit, we hear certain things from the paddock, but we don't get to see all the racing. So we always plan to get home and watch the races. And then we get home and we put the racing on. And I have to tell you the truth, the stress of watching the racing on television after the fact literally puts me to sleep. I can watch from hot pit all day. No problem. It's our job. But put me at home on my sofa and show the camera angle of the bikes going into the chicane at the ridge, and I instantly fall asleep. It's like a protective, a self-protective measure. (laughs) I had a little bit of that watching the racing today. Like there were parts I could watch and parts I couldn't. So funny. You just see it differently when you're used to being there. And it's a little hard to be at home right now. The only thing harder than being home during this Brainerd round, I think, would have been being at the Brainerd round. The Moto America paddock and family is feeling the grief of a big loss this weekend. Scott Briotti is a Stock 1000 rider. He's been with the series I think three years. He's, he predated us. He started before us. So I don't know exactly when he started. I know he was there our first race round in Atlanta. We wound up paddocked close to him in the Atlanta paddock, that first race round that we ran with Moto America. And the Moto America family is pretty shook by losing Scott this weekend during the Brainerd Moto America race round. There's an official announcement from Moto America that was shared in Road Racing World. Robert Lackey with Bison Leathers shared a personal blog post account. Robert and Tasha were close to Scott 
if you want to know a little bit more about Scott and the role that he played in the series, Robert's blog post is a really tough and it's a great read. So I'd point you in that direction. We all do this knowing the risks and knowing the risks doesn't make it any easier when the unthinkable happens out there. It is always traumatic to lose a rider, but I have to say it usually happens to illness or age or traffic accidents. I always reassure my friends and family like they should actually worry about me more on my bicycle than my motorcycle. In terms of serious injury, (laughs) bicycles can be more dangerous from a statistical standpoint than riding on the track. But So rarely does a serious incident result in a fatality on the track, on the bike. So the paddock is really in a bit of shock and a lot of grief this week, this weekend. And our thoughts are with Scott's family, friends, and the responders who were on scene that day, including the medics, the Moto America staff, and our Moto America chaplains. Rest in peace, Scott. You are terribly missed. Now, I I know that started out really sad, and it's really sad and true. And what we see of the sport on television, usually it's the fast guys at the front of the pack, and it's the big dramatic crashes and the podium ceremonies and celebrations, and it's part of how we do the sport is trying to share more of the story. So with that, I am going to break another unwritten rule of the sport today and talk about something really uncool. Some of us aren't naturals and have to do quite a bit of hard work to improve our riding. And frankly, the naturals do too. (laughs) Sometimes we hear about it, sometimes we don't. But we're not all in the sport born naturals at it. And even really talented naturals tend to hit a plateau or to find a place where they need to really work hard to learn, to break through. And a lot of us who take motorcycling seriously do the sport because it's so hard for us, because it's challenging. And because it's challenging, it's really rewarding to get better or to achieve in this sport. So like I said, I'm going to break the rules. And I'm going to talk today about not being fast yet. This is a sport that is measured by speed and safety. And I have a healthy amount of safety in my riding, but only kind of sort of because the way I ride is so gentle on my bike that I'm not even really properly using my bike the way it's designed. My bike is designed to work with more force than I put into it, more inputs than I put into it. I am far too gentle because of my fears and because of the ways that I lack confidence in my skill and my riding. So this isn't what we usually hear talked about in the sport. But the reason I'm going to do this today is because there are a lot of people out there who may be struggling with how to get better and how we get better in a sport that is so consequential and one where we might not get to practice it every day. If you're trying to get better at golf or baseball or running. like Those are things that you may be able to do with high frequency. You might have access to coaching. You might get lots of practice. But for me, since we started our team, all of our time and energy and money goes into sending someone else around the racetrack really, really quickly on our race bike. So I may get you know, maybe five or six or seven good days on my bike each year, if I'm lucky. Hopefully more someday. We're aiming to have more time on our bikes ourselves. But right now with where our program is, you know, we've got our hands full just getting our program on the grid. 
So today I'm going to share with you what I'm working on in my writing and how I'm working on it when I may only get a few good practice days on my bike each year. All right. So if you've been listening to the podcast, you know, I am not fast yet. I wrestle with finding pace riding on the track. It's a funny mix of, you know, I've got some bad habits from 15 or more years of street riding before I started riding on the track. Also, my early riding education, I am a very good rule follower. And so things that I was taught when I was a new rider 20 20 years ago now at this point, like finish all your braking when you are straight up and down. And there's a way that I'm going to say this differently now, but I was taught never break in a corner, never break when you're turning, which really I think what that coaching or what that rule is, is don't go to the brakes when you're in the corner. But what we know now and what riders learn when they start to pick up pace in track and racing conditions is we may need to use our brakes when we're turning. And so that's where a technique called trail braking comes in. I'm not going to go into the intricacies of trail braking, but one of the things that I'm really wrestling with is just overcoming my programming that we finish all of our braking before we turn, because that's actually working against me with carrying speed into corners and with having braking left over still to be done while I'm turning, which is one of the skills I'm working on now. My lap times are slow on the track. I am comfortable twisting the throttle on my corner exits. So I am getting away from the slow point of the corner fairly quickly. I have a big, powerful bike, so there's a lot of power to get me off the slowest point of the turn when I twist the throttle. I'm not abrupt on the throttle, but I am going to the throttle harder, and I see that in my tire wear. And so what that tells me is that I am compensating for how slowly I'm entering corners by using my throttle on the exit because I'm comfortable using my throttle on the exit, but I'm less comfortable with carrying speed into the corner. So the next job for me to do is to work on increasing my corner entry speed to a place where then I can carry more speed through the corner. And I know this, and it takes a lot of courage to practice. And like I said earlier, I don't get a lot of time to practice. I may only have a handful of days a year on my bike on the track. So if I want to get better, and I only get a few days a year to practice, what can I do to get better? I'm going to share with you the three things that are making a difference for me in working on this issue in my riding, even though I have limited time to practice on my bike on the track. And the first thing I'm going to mention is it's kind of wild how it's been pretty remarkable to me the last, you know, two years I've barely ridden. And I've in some ways made more progress on my riding, not riding, than I have repeating bad habits on the track. One of the things that I remember hearing and learning in my first time through Yamaha Champions Riding School is to be a technical rider, not an emotional rider. And I heard that each of the times I went through champ school, and I had no way (laughs) to understand how to put that into practice myself. I started out a very emotional rider. I've had a lot of emotional reactivity meltdowns riding. I used to get really scared with even safe close passes. And it's taken a lot of years to get to a point where now now I have enough knowledge to know whether a pass is a good or bad pass. And I'm less emotionally reactive to passes than I used to be because I just kind of 
expect to get passed badly all the time, and I don't change my riding (laughs) as a result of that expectation. It's kind of easier to just assume I'm going to experience bad passes and not let that bother me. But that's been a very, very long journey. And that journey has also been aided by becoming more technical. Now, I know what a good pass and a bad pass is. And there's something about knowing that technically that helps me stay calmer emotionally when it happens to me. But it's funny, like that that shift from being an emotional rider to being a more technical rider for me comes from operating our team and operating in the Moto America paddock and kind of seeing the sport very technically and not only seeing the sport from the saddle of my own bike where I have to manage all of my emotional responses and reactions to the sport. So there's been something for me really interesting in that shift, just being around more professionalism and learning more about the technical performance of the sport, even if I can't execute it in the saddle yet myself. In my earlier riding and track day learning, I was coached really heavily on my lines. And there is a benefit to coaching riders and students on lines. We do need to learn our way around the track and learn to be consistent and predictable out there. But I do see newer riders who are wrestling with confidence get coached a lot on developing kind of perfect lines. I also got good feedback about my lines because I was working so diligently to learn them. Like I said, I'm a rule follower. And so that was also really confusing because different coaches ride different lines. So every coach I worked with was kind of teaching me or coaching me something a little bit different. Felt like a really confusing way to try and learn how to ride the track. So that happened over the course of years while I was working with kind of individual track day coaches, getting instruction at individual track days. And I think those coaches, they did the best they could. There's only so much you can do with someone who's riding as slowly as I am, who had as little technical knowledge and as little emotional confidence as I had at that time. But I do think that there's a benefit to shifting from coaching lines to fostering newer riders' ability to feel what's happening while they're riding. That is something I didn't really get much of until I started working in the sport, getting exposed to feel. Even the best riders in the sport rarely have perfect laps or perfect lines. It's a sport with lots of variables. So when I stopped only paying attention to trying to learn perfect lines and started trying to learn a more technical and flexible set of skills that I could apply to any corner, any track, anywhere. That has been a huge source of learning for me and a real leap forward in my readiness to improve my riding. That also helped me start to notice and develop feel. And earlier in my riding career, my mental conversation was, I'm doing that wrong. I'm doing that wrong. Oh my gosh, I'm doing this wrong. I'm doing this wrong. I'm not good enough. I'm doing this wrong. What was I doing wrong? If I'm going slow, what am I doing wrong? And now my mental conversation I'm having with myself, and this really comes from being around pro riders and crew chiefs, is what am I feeling? Where am I? What's happening? What am I feeling in the bike? What am I feeling in my body position? Where are my eyes? Where am I looking? And spending my time while I'm riding, gathering that important information instead of beating myself up for my poor performance, you wouldn't believe how much information you gather while you're riding from your eyes, from your senses, from your 
break feel from your body position awareness down to what are you feeling the bike doing? And so developing that ability to notice what I'm feeling in my body and in the bike helps me gather information that helps me determine whether what I'm experiencing is a rider issue or a bike issue. Being overcoached on lines gave me the message that anything that goes wrong is my fault. I'm a bad rider. When really, when you can notice your report cards, notice your lines. Lines are important. (laughs) They help us be predictable out there with other riders on the track. And there are optimum lines for getting around the racetrack quickly. So it's not that we don't pay attention to lines. But once we know our way around the racetrack, once we have an idea of the racing line at a given track, then we can move on to developing feel. And that's the piece that I don't know that all slower riders get coached around. I don't wait until people are fast to start to talk about feel. Because when we have that skill set for gathering information and insight while we're riding that helps us troubleshoot what's going on with the bike and the rider, it might not all be the rider. There might be a bike setup issue, and the rider and the bike can work together to improve and go faster. So developing that ability to notice what's happening, to see what you're feeling, to be aware of what you're doing, to ride more technically, that lets you assess the source of the issues you're experiencing so that you can better solve them. The number two thing that I do because I get so little time to actually practice on the bike, is I study trusted sources. So when I got technical about what I was experiencing after my last track day, I had a chat with my crew chief, aka my husband. And one of the issues I'm having is something that can definitely be helped with bike setup. What I'm feeling in the bike through the two, three, four area at the ridge is something that we can work on bike setup for. And what I know, because my lap times are still really slow, is I need to increase my pace and work on carrying speed. So what can I do about that in between track days? What can I do to make sure that the next time I go out, I I'm setting myself up to improve instead of just to continue practicing (laughs) exactly what I'm doing today. The second tip I'll give you, this next thing is to study trusted sources. And we are so incredibly lucky in this sport that we have trusted sources to turn to. Um, Two that I love are, I'm a huge fan of Ken Hill Coaching's podcast. I'm going to mention a couple specific episodes if you are also wrestling with overslowing your corner entries. So we'll get to that in a minute. There's also a program from Yamaha Champions Riding School called Champ U, which can be a really helpful way if you're kind of just getting started on becoming a more technical rider. It's great exposure to some of the principles of the sport that can help you increase your ability to be technical and increase your overall knowledge about how the bike and rider work together to go around the racetrack. But we're really lucky to have trusted sources in this sport. And so like I said, you know, when I identified, here's my part of what I'm experiencing, I'm doing too much braking too early, I'm still in the habit of, I'm making air quotes of scrubbing off speed, you know, I'm over slowing before the corner. And that means that I'm going into the corner, either at neutral throttle, or I'm having to add throttle to get through the corner, which isn't ideal, where I could be carrying speed into the corner and using my brakes to adjust my pace and trajectory until I'm ready to exit. And then that's where I can go back to the throttle. But I know all that and putting it into practice is a challenge. So trusted sources, of course, I just go to my search engine and type in Ken Hill Coaching Podcast and then whatever keywords I'm looking for help with. And it turns out Ken Hill's third episode (laughs) was on, this is a while ago, Ken Hill's third episode was on overslowing entries. 
And it's a great, I mean, it's absolutely applicable to my situation. And then I got lucky. I am part of Ken's Blaze coaching program and the B-L-A-Y-Z-E. He does a coaching program through a platform called Blaze. And the topic he talked about last week was feel references. And he also has a podcast episode out number 80 is on feel references. And those two things were exactly what I needed to be able to get technical about what I'm experiencing and plan some feel references that I want to feel the next time I'm out there on my bike, working on increasing my corner entry speed so that I can kind of put together a plan for what I want to feel. And that also lets me mentally rehearse it in a couple of corners that I'm familiar with. But I was at the track this weekend. I didn't get to ride. It was a really busy, it was a really busy track day. So I couldn't kind of make the shift from working the track day to being ready to practice. But on the drive home, I was thinking about, okay, well, if I'm going to apply what I've learned from book learning, you know, from listening to Ken's podcast, then what am I afraid of? What could go wrong? What can I do to better prepare myself to practice something new? And I thought, well, I am afraid that I'm going to enter a corner too hot. I am afraid that I'm going to increase my pace on entry and then find myself in a situation that I can't handle. So it turns out (laughs) Ken's episode number 79 (laughs) is about what to do when you enter a corner too hot. So I listened to that one on the way home from my track day, and it gave me super valuable knowledge that then helps me feel better equipped for if I do enter a corner too hot. So the reality is I could stand to break lighter, longer into the kind of corners that I'm practicing in. I could probably, I mean, I have a tremendous amount of margin (laughs) with how I'm riding. Like when I work up the courage to carry more speed into the corner and then use my brakes properly, I guarantee you, and I know this, it's going to feel so much better than what I'm doing today that I don't need that ace in the hole of entering the corner too hot because I could stand to enter the corner significantly hotter than I am and it's only going to make things feel better. But that combination of studying those trusted sources about the specific issue I'm having over slowing the entry, what else I can do to plan for more confidence and to put together a plan for myself. We'll talk about that in a sec with that episode about feel references. And then asking myself, what am I afraid of? Or what do I need to be prepared for? And if I'm afraid that I'm going to enter a corner too hot and not have the skills to handle that, then I can demystify that for myself by looking at that other resource and that episode on entering too hot. So Ken, you're the best. Thank you for everything you do in the sport and for our program and for me personally and my riding, because it's just pretty freaking cool to be able to just hit a search engine and find exactly the technical information I need to create a plan for my next time out and to mentally rehearse. And so that brings me to that last thing, the third one I just mentioned, which is having a plan. And here, because I have something specific I'm working on, it's something that makes me a little nervous to do myself. It'd be a lot easier if I was able to line up my schedule with one of the coaches I work with and know that I can go out with a trusted coach to work on increasing my corner entry. But I have done some of that with my trusted coaches, and it's time now for me to put it into practice when I'm not with my coach. And so what I'm doing now is making sure that I have a plan and I set myself up for success with trying to introduce that change to my riding. So for example, we had a great small, low traffic, really small group day a while back with the track day org that I work with. And that was a phenomenal day (laughs) for me to practice improving my riding. It was low numbers. I was riding around friends and people I knew well and people who were predictable and who I knew that I was in conditions where I was able to practice safely. 
the track day this weekend was a bigger group. There was a little bit more of a spread in the class that I ride in, so varying degrees of skill. And so then on a more crowded day, it's really important that you be predictable, but it's even more important on a crowded day that you be consistent and predictable. And so on a more crowded day on the track, especially because my head wasn't great after the news from Brainerd on Friday. And because my head wasn't great this weekend because of just how busy I was with the track day, my responsibility level was really high. So I wasn't able to make the cognitive shift to feel super confident to go out and work on my own riding. So because of all those conditions, and the temps were awful, (laughs) it was so hot this weekend, huge props to everybody who got out there and rode, y'all are animals and did amazing. But because of all of those conditions, I knew it wasn't the right weekend for me to practice what I had planned to. So instead, you know, I did a little bit more book learning. I listened to a couple more podcasts on the trip home. I have a really solid written plan for myself for the next time I get a chance to practice. And then the next low numbers day that I land at, it's on. I know exactly what I need to do, and I'm ready to practice. All right, friends. So that's three things you can do in between your track days or in between your practice sessions to make sure that you're able to make progress on what you're working on. And one is to focus on being technical, not emotional. What can you learn? What's happening? What do you notice? What do you remember? That helps you do number two, which is identify and study trusted sources. And the two I mentioned are Ken Hill Coaching and the Yamaha Champions Riding School Champ U program. And then number three is have a plan. Make yourself a plan that's technical, that sets you up for success, and know what the conditions are that you need to be able to execute it successfully, and make sure that you plan to practice on a day where those conditions are present. It's just way too easy in this sport to find yourself discouraged, confused by conflicting, or sometimes suspect advice and to let that frustration diminish your experience of the sport. But when we get technical, what am I feeling? What is the bike doing? What am I afraid of? Is this a rider issue? Is this a bike issue? How can I demystify what's happening? How can I get technical about it to create a plan so that I can feel the fear of trying something new and do it anyway? When we can ask those questions and get technical with a writing, that helps us create the conditions to be able to improve. That's it for today, friends. I want to say a big thank you to Cascade Motorcycle Safety. They have been a sponsor this year of our team, and our season has not gone according to plan, and we really sincerely appreciate Cascade's support. They're a... (laughs) I have to stop myself because I always want to say they're a motorcycle fun. They're a motorcycle safety and training organization and skills building organization here in the Pacific Northwest, but their emphasis is on making riding more fun by building skills. So we love working with Jesse and Brandy and the team at Cascade. Check out Cascade if you're looking for skill building and for training opportunities and practice opportunities that help make riding more fun for you. We'd also like to thank Law Tigers of Washington for their continued support. Again, our season hasn't gone according to plan, and Law Tigers is another one of the sponsors who's stayed with us and supported us this season, even though our schedule has not exactly looked like what we thought it would at the beginning of the season. So thank you, Law Tigers, for your support. If you're looking for help with your motorcycle dreams, we also have a little bit of an update at Counterweight Motorsports, the shop that my husband operates here in the Pacific Northwest. We build fast bikes for serious riders, and we've got an 
awesome mechanic on staff. So where things used to get a little tricky with our schedule while Chris was on the road for the racing season, now we've got a really solid mechanic back at the shop. So we do have service and project appointments available this summer. We're also starting to schedule the off season. So if you've got a bike build or if you need performance-related service or other kinds of performance-related support with your bikes, give us a ring. You can find contact information for the shop at cwmoto.com, and we'd love to hear from you and get you on the schedule. All right, friends, that's all for today. Remember, drop me your questions at sarah at cdubmoto.com. I am a without an H, so it's S-A-R-A at cwmoto.com. And we are cdub underscore moto everywhere in social media and the Moto Curious on Instagram. You can also join our behind the scenes community. It's hosted on Mighty Networks. It's awesome. We'll put some messages up about where to find that in our social media. You can click through and then if you really want to connect, that's the place to do it. We share extra behind the scenes updates and content from the paddock that we don't share other places since that is a smaller, more intimate community of our closest fans and friends. But if you're hearing this, you are welcome there as well. So check out our social media and you'll find more information about the CW Moto, Moto America behind the scenes community that we host on Mighty Networks. Thanks so much. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe and tell your friends. We're looking to get heard by more folks who are curious about the sport. We try really hard to reach race fans as well as their families and spouses and friends and other people who, goodness gracious, don't understand why we do this, but are curious about it nonetheless. So we'd love your word of mouth. And thanks again for tuning in.